On this edition of the Fifth Estate, how far are international students willing to go to get an education in Canada? The average Punjabi family will have to work 74 years to pay one year's of tuition. And how far will Canadian colleges go to recruit them? The focus has been numbers driven, numbers, 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 and that's all, literally, that anyone cares about. We reveal the deception, selling dreams to desperate families. We're going to be looking back at this in 20 years. And how will we look back on this? Well, just like a scar, like an exploitation of, of this, this specific group of young people. And the toll that takes on students. We have a connection with the one funeral home in India. They're sending back dead bodies. What? Each, Each month? month? I'm Mark Kelly in Toronto. Colleges and universities around the world are in a race now to recruit international students, and Canada is all in. So why the race? Well, post-secondary schools in this country charge international students five times the tuition domestic students pay for the same education. And we investigated and found what international students are told and what they're sold is a far cry from the Canadian dream they thought they were paying for. This is the Fifth Estate. These international students came to Canada full of hope. They were lured here with the promise of a better future. On 17th of May, they sent us an official email from Alpha College. No one else, they are saying that we are unable to give you seats. Instead, they're outside their college in Toronto, claiming they've been lied to. We need explanation. Sold a second-rate school experience. We come from our country to here with lots of dreams, with lots of hope. Like we, we think that college is our family. If college don't think about us, then who will think? And they want Canadians to know their story. Like all stories of hope, this one starts with a dream. Gurdeep Singh has spent years toiling on his family farm, growing wheat and rice in the breadbasket of India. It's back-breaking, lonely work. But here's the payoff. <laughs> All his sweat and sacrifice has enabled him to send his only child, Dilpreet, to school in Canada. Singh says he sold two trucks to raise the $28,000 to send her to Toronto. He's bet the farm on her future. With few job prospects here in rural Punjab, one of India's biggest exports is the country's youth. Singh says in his village alone, some 300 young people have left to study abroad. They take with them the hopes and dreams of those they've left behind with no guarantee of success. Nineteen-year-old Dilpreet talks to her parents every day to ease the loneliness and the pressure to succeed. Do you feel that pressure, though, that you don't want to disappoint your parents? I don't want to disappoint. Yeah, I do feel the pressure. We have to say something to them to console them and to say, no, don't worry, Dad, I'm fine, I'm doing good. So that's kind of lie, but... Why do you have to lie? Because we don't really want them to be depressed. We don't really want them to cry for us because they sent us here to, be, to have a great life. 
Instead, like many, she feels they were sold a lie. The face of Canada's colleges is changing. Over the last five years, the number of international college students has more than doubled. Most are from rural India, enrolled in small career colleges, and many are struggling to make it. My course is tourism. Computer programming. Nursing leadership and healthcare management. Before they even step into a classroom, newly arrived international students like these line up for social insurance numbers so they can get a job. Their parents' hard work only covers a portion of their costs. I'm here to get my SIN number and uh, I'm waiting here for from 6.30. And finding a job isn't easy either. Dilpreet needed work so badly, she took a job in a plastics factory 100 kilometers from where she's living. Like, it's too far from my home, so they provide ride. So it takes around two hours to go there, and it takes two hours to come back. So it's like 12 hours of work, four hours of, like, traveling, so it's like 16 hours in total. And I have to manage my college, I have to manage my home and everything. And finding a home in a red-hot real estate market puts even more pressure on these students. There's little available, little affordable, making them an easy mark for unscrupulous landlords. Dilpri went from an only child in India to sharing a crowded house of students she'd never met before. So we are just one floor, and we are nine people on that floor. In the basement, it's like six people in the basement. So it's like 15 people in just one uh, in one house, which is crazy. It's like too messy, and it's like too congested. Who are the six people in the basement? So they are all students. Harpreet Kaur took that same well-worn path as so many of those students from Punjab to college in Canada. She's a shy 19-year-old carrying the weight of expectations of her family back home. How much has your father paid so far for, for your education? Um, about 30000 and where did he get $30,000? By mortgage, the land, or some bank loans. Yep. She tells her parents about her life in Canada, living with seven strangers, working overnight shifts to pay her way. But after investing all this money, they tell her there is no turning back now. I can't live. Uh, without my father, it is my first experience. Even when I went to like my uncle and aunt's house, and I called my father and again and again that, oh, can you please come? Can you please come? <laughs> Bring me at home, like. What did your father say to you when you told him that? He told me that you should. Like, you, you are a brave girl. Sorry. And it takes courage to fight back. That's what this group is doing, naming and shaming employers who are exploiting international students. This protest led a restaurant owner to settle with a student for $16,000 in unpaid wages. With students drowning in debt, they're vulnerable, underpaid, overworked, an easy target for exploitation. How is your health now? Are you taking medicine? Yes, I'm taking medicine. All, all, all okay. Nirlip Gill is with Punjabi Community Health Services in Brampton. He counsels international students in distress, like this 25-year-old. How is the your like thought process now? Gill found him sleeping in parks, addicted to drugs, a life in crisis. He brought him back to his parents in India. Loneliness. They are missing their families because they are not used to live alone back home in India. That is one main factor to getting that uh, mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. 
depression, stressed, away from home, away from family. We're hearing reports of high numbers of suicides among international students in, in, in Brampton who are coming over here. There are multiple reasons for the deaths. On an average, uh, we have a connection with uh, one funeral home, that is Lotus Funeral Home. On an average, they are sending four to five dead bodies, only international students, each month. What? Each, each month? month, four to five dead bodies of only international students in India, they are sending back dead bodies. You know. So with so much at stake, are the colleges part of the solution to help students or are they part of the problem? Coming up, we take a closer look. They're doing everything they can to find more ways to bring in more students. Their lobby is more students, more students, more students, whether it is um, increasing class sizes, whether it is ir irresponsibly bringing in students that they don't have enough support to offer. I mean, it doesn't matter. What matters is numbers, right? So that's the issue. If competing for international students were a sport, Canada would be on the podium. We rank third behind the US and Australia in the race for students. Those students pump $23 billion a year into Canada's economy. So what are they getting for their money? Just ask Dilpreet Kaur. An advisor urged her to enroll in a college she'd never heard of and knew nothing about. I don't know, like, why he just suggested me this college that I'm having right now. So they were like, okay, you have this college, get this. So Which college is that? It's Alpha College, St. Lawrence Alpha College. So I'm currently in second semester there. If you haven't heard of Alpha College either, this could be why. It's a small career college located in the outskirts of Toronto. 100% of its students are international, 99% from India. But Dilpreet wonders if Alpha is such a sought after college, why aren't any Canadian kids enrolled there? If there are like 500 students, I have never seen a Canadian student in that. So it means we are all international students and we are who are supporting that college, that's all. If the international students are not going in that college, I guess like no one's going to that college because I haven't seen a Canadian student there anyways. Alpha is a private for-profit college that partners with St. Lawrence, a public college in Kingston, Ontario. These public-private partnerships allow public schools in Ontario's outlying areas to cash in on the bonanza of international students who want to study in and around Toronto. The problem is, of course, nobody had a plan for those numbers at all, right? But the gist of it is the focus has been numbers-driven, numbers, 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 and that's all, literally, that anyone cares about, right, is how many international students can we pack in and how much money can we get? Earl Blaney runs an immigration and advocacy group. He says the international student gold rush started 10 years ago after the federal government declared Canada needed more skilled immigrants. Since then, in Ontario, for example, public colleges saw a 15% decline in domestic student enrollments, but a 342% growth in international student enrollments. I want to learn more about the role of the colleges sure. in all of this. And, and how have you seen their, their appetite for international students change over the past decade? The, the, their appetite is insatiable. They're doing everything they can to find more ways to bring in more students. Their lobby is more students, more students, more students. So that's, that's kind of how the industry has changed. It's gone from international students, like, let's really like, make the best of this. Let's do what the policy says to let's pack them in, right? And so that's how the industry has changed. And it's pretty ugly. Ugly in many ways. Many Canadian colleges are overwhelmingly reliant on money from international students to stay afloat with little attention given to the quality of the education they're paying for. 
Just last year, Ontario's Auditor General raised red flags, saying there are quality audits at public colleges, but as for their private partners, most of their programs have not yet been subject to an independent quality assurance audit. Anne Ginn and Christina DeCary are teachers at St. Lawrence College. They say there are so many reasons why international students struggle to keep up in school. Several of them living in certain circumstances where they can't um, necessarily even have a bed, let alone a desk, sharing a computer. Um, they don't have a bed? Yeah. <laughs> yes. They sleep in shifts. Yeah. Well, they sleep um, in shifts. Some of them do, yes. Some of them yeah. do. So you're not necessarily renting a bedroom, you're renting a bed, and yep. that bed is not yours 24 hours a day, it's yours eight hours a day. Well, yeah. I've spoken with yeah. one recruiter who says, look, the game now is about numbers, numbers, mm -hmm. numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, more Except that they're people, people, people. Mm -hmm. They are individuals. They are young people who are, they're embarking on a dream, on a journey. If they come mm -hmm. to class and they haven't eaten, then they're not going to learn. If they're, they've stayed up all night to do a night shift because their boss told them and they didn't want to say no, they're falling asleep in class, or um, if they're facing some kind of other stress like homesickness or um, being exploited by a landlord, these things all come to the classroom. And so we're not, when you're teaching, you're not just teaching the material, you're teaching the people who are there and you have to face these, mm -hmm. these challenges in order to help them learn. So if you think colleges are now pumping the brakes to slow the flow of international students, think again. This is Apply Board. Based in Kitchener, Ontario, the company's mission? Educate the world. It's international student recruiting on steroids. Apply Board is one of the world's largest online platforms for international student recruitment. With offices around the world, Apply Board connects students with schools so they can study abroad. What do you believe has been the main attraction for students who want to come to Canada? Why Canada? I think it's a dream country in many sense. I think Canada is a lined off mind for pe people that want to build something better. Our one team. We build each other up and grow side by side. This corporate video showcases the company co-founders, three brothers who came to Canada as international students. Right now we are the biggest, biggest uh, company producing students to Canada and uh, we are so glad that we have done this and also that uh, we're so glad too because we need international students. <laughs> Apply Board uses an army of recruiters to enroll international students and feed that insatiable appetite of Canadian colleges and universities. How many agents do you have on the ground? Uh, we tend to call them recruitment partner, and there recruitment is a partner. There, there is enough. a. I'm, I stand corrected. How many recruitment partners do you have on the ground? I appreciate ground? that, though. Um, that's a word that Apply Board actually invented. Okay. Uh, so recruitment partner, and there, there is where we work about 10,000 vetted recruitment partner is a network that we uh, build up in the past five years in 60, 70 plus countries. Apply Board is paid to recruit students for hundreds of Canadian colleges and universities, so they don't have to do it themselves. The aggregator model is basically just a large corporation signs, signs recruitment agreements with, these, with College A, and then they sublet that recruitment agreement to 10,000 plus sub-agents on the ground with, who have absolutely no direct connection with the college. The college has no ability to screen them. They have no ability to review their work or conduct with the student, promises made, advertising, you name it, right? And some promises are empty promises. Let them pack it themselves, right? Just ask these volunteers with Calsa Aid, an international aid agency with a chapter in Brampton, Ontario. Our biggest projects are internationally. We set up uh, water projects in remote villages across the planet. We've set up uh, solar projects. We work with uh, governments. We work natural disasters. We work man-made disasters like war and stuff like that. That's what we do. That's what we're known for. This is what we're not known for is filling grocery bags and giving to international students. That's not something that we've ever done until now. Singh says Canada has created its own humanitarian crisis 
by charging international students as much as five times the tuition Canadian students pay for the same education. The average Punjabi family will have to work 74 years, I think it is, 74 years to pay one year's of tuition. That's a huge amount of burden for a family to pick up, right? That's not a 25-year mortgage. That is a 74-year mortgage that you now have to pick up. All in the hopes that, you know, maybe our child can have a better life than we do. And consider this. International students now contribute more money to the budgets of public colleges in Ontario than the Ontario government does. Coming up, we go to India with a hidden camera to reveal just how misleading agents can be as they recruit students for Canadian colleges. In terms of the, uh, the, re the, the agents on the ground, who's regulating them? Well, there's nobody regulating them. And this is really, really the sad part of it. Here in India, the pitch to young people is clear. Canada needs immigrants. Canadian post-secondary schools need students. This is where the sales job starts. And as you're about to see, so too does the deception. Hello. For every kid with a dream to study and settle abroad, there's a long line of businesses just waiting to make a buck off them. These students are cramming for their high-stakes English proficiency exam. These prep programs run about 300 bucks a pop. Fail here, and the dream dies. Good afternoon, class. Please have a seat. Sure, we are supposed to read just the questions. Before questions, what is important to read the? Instructions. It's estimated more than a million Indian students take these classes every year, hoping for that golden ticket, an education in coveted countries. With a show of hands, how many of you would like to go to Canada? And why Canada? Much good education facilities are available for the students. So I think that's why I want to go to Canada. I would uh, love to go there just because it's environment and it's safe and even the every uh, in the even the institutions have provide a very good facility about the education I basically want to stay there have my white collar job and live a life that I have always dreamed of this school is regulated the problem most aren't there are an estimated 5,500 English proficiency schools in Punjab alone. Some give struggling students a passing grade for a price, setting them up for failure even before they leave India. I'm calling from the Australian High Commission. Listen in as one student who passed the exam is called to verify his English proficiency. What was your score in English in your last semester? Sorry, ma'am. What was your English score in your last semester of bachelor's? I want to study this course because I want to make my career as a business administration. I applied for MBA at Victoria University, Australia. Do you have any questions for me? No, ma'am. Thank you. The result? Teachers tell us some students show up to class in Canada unable to speak English. Thinking about the students who would be talking during class, mm -hmm. and it took us a while to figure out they were translating for each other. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, okay, so let me make little groups of four and let me get somebody who's really strong in English and make sure that they can translate for the people who aren't. But it took a while to notice that that's what mm -hmm. was happening. But I mean, I know they, they have to pass an English proficiency test yeah. in order to get some here. Some people are very good at writing tests but not very good at speaking English. Yeah.
So who convinces a student who can't speak English to come study in Canada? Shady education agents do. Students pay agents to help them get into Canadian schools and then apply for a student visa. And here's where things get even murkier. Vinay Hari is the self-proclaimed number one education agent in India. In this ad, he says no English, no problem. He guarantees students a visa to Canada, again, all for a price. Canada has been focusing on Punjab, and, and, and give me an idea of what it's like on the ground there for, for students, meeting recruiters, meeting these agents. Just in the state of Punjab or North India, you'll probably see uh, thousands of uh, travel agents acting like education agents. So it's actually a pretty large industry in India. Ravi Lokan Singh runs a global student recruitment company. He's one of the good guys. He says many aren't. And I don't want to call them education agents at all, because I don't think they are promoting education. I think they are just promoting a way to reach Canada. And I think this is very important for me, to, because after working in this trade for 31 years, I find it very difficult to work in uh, Punjab market, per se, because there's no counselling really taking place. This agency promises easy and speedy visas. Notice there's no mention of education. The ads, the empty promises, are everywhere in India. Come to Canada, Vinay Hari will make your dreams come true. In terms of the, uh, the, re the, the agents on the ground, who's regulating them? Well, there's nobody regulating them. And this is really, really the sad part of it. These agents charge students fees for their services. But they're also paid by Canadian colleges to recruit students. As much as $2,000 for each student who enrolls. We wanted to see what promises the agents were making students and their parents. This father and son, who were interested in a Canadian education, agreed to wear a hidden camera as they met agent after agent. Easy? Far from it. An international student would need to work at least 50 hours a week at minimum wage to cover their cost of tuition and living expenses. And many are sending money home as well. The father then asks about a well-established college in Toronto, but the agent directs him to a little-known career college. Hanson College is likely paying that agent a higher commission. When contacted, the school wouldn't confirm either way. Then another agent with a big promise. Again, not so easy. There are currently more than 250,000 people in a backlog waiting for their permanent residency to be approved. Even after the father and son left the agent's offices, they were approached on the street by other recruiters. In this cutthroat competition, they'll promise almost anything to get some business. Australia, New Zealand, the UK and Ireland signed a joint code of conduct for the ethical recruitment of international students to ensure agents are honest, transparent and act with integrity. Canada chose not to sign on. It's a shame, if you ask me. You would think that they, there are hundreds and thousands of students landing up in Canada. Some of these classrooms would be filled with students from Punjab. But there is really no mechanism to put some code of ethics around the way students are recruited. The system is built on uh, misinformation. They're all acting as unlicensed immigration consultants across the board, um, almost without exception. 
the Canadian government is well aware of that. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, but uh, the, the bottom line is that these recruiters are, if they don't get the person through, they don't get paid. So they, it's just the fire as many darts as you can at the board and hope for a high score in terms of annual income, right? I mean, that's what's happening. If we are wrong, we would leave the premises right now. But we all know that we paid our fees. So what happens when the focus is on numbers, numbers, numbers? This does. Last spring, hundreds of students at Alpha College were told their classes had been deferred to a later date. On 17th of May, they sent us an official email from Alpha College, no one else. They are saying that we are unable to give you seats. Alpha took their tuition checks, but over-enrolled beyond its capacity. For some, the semester would be suspended. They said, you are on unofficial break, we can't enroll you. And uh, I come here two to three times and they didn't hear my problems and didn't resolve it. Later on, they uh, told us that you are on unofficial break. I have completed my first semester in the Alpha College and uh, after the first semester, they are giving me unofficial drop. And who emerged as one of the student leaders? Dilpreet Kaur. The students expressed their concerns regarding spring enrollment. The kicker, after months of online classes, this was the first time she'd ever laid eyes on the college her family paid for. You were here for nine months and you hadn't seen Alpha College? No, so we saw that on the, the day of the protest, I was like, okay, so this is my college. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. So before coming here, it was kind of thing in my mind, Canada is so beautiful. I'm gonna come here, just earn well, live a life, uh, like have fun at the weekends, like we saw in the movies. So when I came here, it was different, but yeah, it was completely different. The protest dragged on for almost two weeks. Eventually, Alpha kicked students off the property. Welcome to Canada. So we wanted to use the washroom mm -hmm. and there were this note. It was saying no students allowed. You think, okay, college is mine. So this, this is the college where I'm gonna spend years and months and I'm gonna make memories there and everything like that. But when they just say, you're not allowed, you cannot even use the washroom, that is heartbreaking. Even the shy Harpreet Kaur joined the protest. She felt she had nothing left to lose. My friends, uh, like from other colleges, like they called me, you, what are you doing? Like, it is not safe, it is not good. Like, what are you doing? They, they thought that protesting was a bad idea? Yeah, they thought. And uh, then I told them that it is for our rights. Then if we can't stand for our rights, then who can stand? Ultimately, the students won. Alpha backed down, no deferrals took place. The Fifth Estate obtained this document, which outlines what went wrong. In fall 2021, Alpha enrolled 2,500 international students. In spring 2022, right before the protest, the school doubled that number. We obtained numbers that show Alpha College has the physical space to accommodate just over 400 students. So the deferment was mismanagement. The deferment was uh, uh, the administration office, the administrator, the overall directors, um, the school. Their inability to keep track of the number of students that they were enrolling. I think they were just seeing dollar signs. I think they just have, because it's a private school, they have stakeholders. I think they're just looking to impress them. What's more, education agents or online platforms like Applyboard recruited 100% of those international students for Alpha, though it was up to the college to decide how many students to accept. Singh says the recruitment system is built on quantity, not quality. We should not be selling ourselves to what's the easiest way, what's the fastest way, what's the cheapest way, you know what I mean? Like it sh this should not be part of the ter determination. It should be, let's get the best people internationally, bring them in so they, they, we can build a strong Canada. And about the agents in India? 
that played a role in the immigration. Huh? Fire them all. So what led Alpha to over-enroll international students? No one from Alpha or St. Lawrence College would come on camera to discuss the protest or the plight of their international students. When we come back, we take the students' concerns to Canada's immigration minister. The federal government's 10-year push to attract more international students from India has created a massive backlog. 160,000 visa applications waiting to be processed, leaving students in a lurch. So some are calling on a higher power for help. Students leave these toy planes at temples as an offering. The hope that elusive visa will arrive on a wing and a prayer. He says he comes to the temple to ease his stress and ask God for a little help. Speechless. With so many students from India eager to come to Canada, Apply Board opened a recruiting office here to deal with pent up demand. LinkedIn startup. Those education agents we approached in India with a hidden camera work with Apply Board. I'm always a big believer access and transparency. Yeah. That's what the Apply Board could do, that's what we have done, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Build the transparency for the students to make the best decision. And that's a good point. But so we wanted to know more about what's happening on the ground too. And, and like you, we're interested in finding more about transparency. Um, so we showed some of what we caught on camera to Apply Board co-founder Mehdi Basiri. He was also saying that you can go anywhere in Toronto and get an office job once you go through a career college. Is that a fair promise to be able to make students? I don't know about the office job. I think now is the perfect time and opportunity for anyone looking for an opportunity to find a job as the dream job of everyone. No, I started from Pista Delivery. And what about the promise of permanent residency? I just want to ask you about that one. What they're being told here is there's no problem getting permanent residency. The message, the message is absolutely wrong. No one should or, and it's clearly in our website, it's clear in our code of conduct, it's actually a terms of condition, no one should. And that says, except if you're an immigration consultant, that you should be able to advise, no one should. Apply Board says it's made substantial investments in training its recruiting partners and has a code of conduct that is enforced when needed. As for Earl Blaney, the international student advocate, he says treating these students like a product instead of people is bad for them, bad for Brand Canada. Can we improve the quality of education? Can we get people jobs? Can we get them skills? Can we get them degrees that they will take home and be successful with? Mm -hmm. Absolutely we can do that, but we're not trying, right? So that's the problem. We're trying to pack them in, we're trying to get their money, and we're trying to say, okay, job done, right? It's not how students feel about it, right? Like, they want something, and we're not delivering, period. Nobody seems to want to take responsibility. 100%. Like, who's, who's, who's responsible, right? Who is responsible? Unfortunately, the answer is no one. Somebody has to be responsible. Sean Fraser, who's it going to be? Sean Fraser is Canada's Minister of Immigration. We took the students' fight to his office in Ottawa. Reports have come out that have said that Canada is now getting an international reputation for our post-secondary schools that are treating these kids as cash cows. You know, it's, it's something that actually troubles me greatly. There are certain private career colleges that I'm convinced have come to exist 
just to make a buck on the back of the international student program. It's completely unacceptable so to me. So what do we do about this? I think we need to do a better job of working with provincial governments to say, we're hearing stories that are coming from X institution. It's really problematic for us. They're trying to grow their acceptance of international students to an extraordinary number. We have concerns that it might be about financial impropriety rather than providing a quality education to students who are coming here trying to better themselves. Nobody's cracking down on, on these agents. Nobody's cracking down on the institutions that are taking the money. Well, where's the accountability? If there is examples of promoters who are tied to institutions that are taking advantage of students, then we need to work with provincial governments to say, you have a problem with these certain institutes. Uh, if they, they don't need my permission to de-designate uh, an institution from the program. We're highlighting a case where there was one school in Toronto. I mean, they went from 2,500 students one year to 5,000 students the next year. They only have a capacity for 400 students in the building. Then they told these students they've over-enrolled and they were, had to defer them. These, these kids had to protest. They're paying for their own exploitation. It's distasteful. I have no patience for it. It's not what the program was designed for. It's designed to provide an education to students and to benefit Canadian communities, not to uh, allow uh, sham operations to open up uh, to financially abuse uh, innocent students who have in their mind what Canada could be, only to be let down because they've been sold a false bill of goods. So the students have been heard but their fight is far from over. I think that we're going to be looking back at this in 20 years. And, and how will we look back on this? Well, just, like it's like a scar, like an exploitation of, of this, this specific group of young people. I think it's unethical to recruit someone when they're not going to be able to succeed. As for Dilpreet, she's learned some hard lessons about being an international student in Canada. After all this protesting and everything happened, this experience, it, it really made us feel like they just want our money and they just want us to give money and like again and again and get rich, filling their pockets and don't really care about us at all. What about her dad, Gurdeep Singh, who bet his farm on her future? He wonders after all the money he spent, was it even worth it? But he says he's so proud of his daughter, urging her not to quit now. Stay courageous, he says. Keep fighting for your rights. Don't lose faith, and one day, you'll reach your destination. I'm Stephen D'Souza, next week on The Fifth Estate. And I glassed along the bank here, and it looked like a dirt swap. Kind of three of them laying there. Oh, I didn't see the incident. Investigating the death of an Indian migrant family on the Manitoba U.S. border. The last location we're aware of for the Patel family in the greater Toronto area was at a hotel on the 15th. I was just wondering if we could talk to you for a few minutes. I don't want to talk to you. What we've learned about an alleged human smuggler who could hold the key to what happened. It's a very scary thought to see and hear that they were surveilling them since 2018 and could have prevented the death um, of Patel family. The obvious question is, could the Patel's journey have been stopped? Yeah, that, that's, that's a fair question to ask. That's next week on The Fifth Estate. If you have a story you think needs to be told, send us your tips at fifthtips at cbc.ca. And for a more confidential way to contact us, visit our website at cbc.ca slash fifth and click on Secure Drop. For more about our investigations, sign up to get the Fifth Estate's weekly newsletter. 
We'll keep you posted on stories we brought you and share some behind-the-scenes details. Head to our website, cbc.ca slash fifth, and subscribe there. 